Hi everyone, I'm Nita Hone, and it's Saturday. That means it's time for Nita Notes, my weekly vlog series about limited magic. We're talking about Modern Horizons 3 today, and I think it'll be our last video about this subject, because by next weekend we'll have gotten an early look at all of the Bloomboro mechanics, and I'll be able to start talking about those. And then the weekend after that, it will be Bloomboro preview, not preview season, uh, set review season uh, the week after that. So it's all gonna happen pretty fast. So in this last video of Modern Horizons 3, we're gonna be doing a companion piece to what I did last week. Last week I looked at the cards that are being taken too highly based on what their 17 lands win rate is. This week we're gonna be looking at cards that are being taken too late based on what their 17 lands win rate is. In other words, these are cards that are being collectively undervalued by people based on how they are actually performing. Uh, 17 Lands, by the way, is a great website for tracking your limited data, for tracking tons and tons of players of limited data, so you can get an idea about how cards are performing. There's always a caveat with this kind of video. You know, data isn't the end-all, be-all. There are a lot of things it doesn't tell us, um, a lot of things that it hints at that we can't ever fully understand, but... It is a useful tool, and I do think it's interesting to look at cards, how they've sort of panned out based on how people are valuing them and things like that. It's just an interesting way to discuss limited in general, to think about, you know, future and past designs and, and things like that. So let's go ahead and dive right in. As usual, I've got a baseline card. I'm using the same one I used for the last video because it's just such a perfect kind of baseline card, and that's because it's dog umbra and we can all agree that it's like you know a solid playable not much more than that and the data bears that out this is the kind of card that is exactly as good as you expect it to be and that players are taking it about the right time given how good it is uh it's taken around pick 7.4 and it's got a win rate of 55.6 percent the average win rate for this format on 17 lands is 55.1 percent so this is like you know right in the middle of the road in terms of how good of a card it is you're gonna play one in a lot of your white decks, but you're not gonna value them that highly, is kind of how it how it sums up. And every single card on this list is taken later than Dog Umber is, but has a higher win rate. So, you know, that's another thing that makes it a good baseline card, is a good jumping off point. All right, so let's start with Collective Resistance, which is being taken around pick 7.6 and has a win rate of 57.6%. So, this is a card that I liked in the set review mostly because I thought it had this very reasonable floor uh, where if you don't escalate it at all, it's Disenchant that has, uh, or Naturalize, I guess more accurately, that has um, combat trick upside that can blink removal spells, or if your creature's the right size, help it survive combat and kill an opposing creature. And then it has this crazy upside, you know, that I mentioned in the set review where sometimes you can get like a three for one out of it. I didn't think you're gonna get the three for one that often, and you don't really, but you do get a one for one with this as easily as I expected. You know, you're gonna find targets for it if you need to. There, there are plenty of artifacts and enchantments in the set, including creatures, and those are usually the best things to destroy, but there's some powerful artifacts and enchantments that aren't creatures that it can go after too. And if you have it in your hand, you can always just use it to save your best creature from a removal spell as well. It just ends up being really flexible. You know, generating a two for one with it isn't crazy and getting a one for one with it is pretty automatic. And then it still has this crazy upside. And I think, you know, the win rate shows you that this is a card every green deck should probably be playing one of because naturalize is better than normal in this set since we have so many enchantments and artifacts. And we know by now that target creature gains hexproof and indestructible until end of turn is a surprisingly good effect to have in limited, especially on a card that's kind of modal. Um, you know, the problem, if this card only did that, it wouldn't be nearly as good. It would be way too narrow, and we see that all the time, especially at two mana. But it has these other modes, and then all of them can be powerful in the right situation, and that modality is surprisingly strong, and I think the win rate is bearing that out. All right, let's take a look at Mandibular Kite, a card that I've liked a lot in the format. Blue-White Aggro has probably been my most consistently good deck in the format. I probably average, like, between five and six wins when I draft Blue-White. And it's, you know, the kite is a great one drop. It's taken around pick 7.7 and has a win rate of 58%. So it's interesting they compare directly to Dog Umbra. When we're comparing cards of different colors, um, you know, it's not perfect because sometimes what's causing a card's higher than average or lower than average win rate is actually that other cards in that color are bad. Not so much that the card in particular that has the win rate that I'm talking about is bad. And that's one of the things that you know, data isn't perfect for. 
But when you, you can use it as a tool, of course, but comparing white cards to one another is like a whole other thing, and I think it is even more valuable. And Mandibular Kite has a win rate 2.4% higher than Dog Umbra, which is, in magic terms, pretty massive, right? Like, that is a huge uh, leap in win rate, and it's being taken, you know, 0.3, uh, on average, 0.3 picks later. And that shouldn't be happening. Like, the kite is incredibly good. Not only is it just, like, a good card in general because a one-mana, one-one flyer that if your opponent ever deals with it or if you have to chump with it or whatever, leaves behind an equipment, albeit an inefficient one, uh, that would be a good card anyway. But the blue-white energy deck in this format, especially, it's good in red-white too, of course, but blue-white's where it's really good because you just end up curving out with a bunch of flyers and your opponent just can't block any of them. If they do play things that, that can block, you can usually get, get it out of the way and just keep swinging. Um, it goes really well in that style of deck. And then it, it's, you know, I've won a lot of games in the late game by just finding lethal by moving a mandibular kite to something and attacking. Like, I've probably won, I don't know, seven or eight games just where a mandibular kite's equip ended up happening. And this is like a really high win rate for a common and a lot higher than Dog Umbra. And uh, people should be valuing it a lot, a lot more. You know, there are white decks in the format that don't really want it. You know, red, white, and blue, white is where you really want to be. It's not nearly as good in green, white, but green, white on the whole isn't a great color pair to end up in. But it's just a good card in general. And then it has this set specific stuff going on where being a cheap flyer that lets you curve out is a really big deal. Next up, I've got Mindless Conscription, which is taking around pick 7.7, .7, and it has a win rate of 58.1%. So, uh, this is an interesting one, and, you know, up until the last couple of weeks, I wasn't a huge fan of the blue-black deck in this format, but because now it's open all the time, <laughs> because, you know, draft is sometimes self-correcting. It's not always if a color or a color pair are too underpowered, but if enough people are like, okay, the blue-black deck's not good, and suddenly you can get all the signposts and commons and payoffs for what that deck wants to do, which over the last two or three weeks has been happening, Suddenly that deck's pretty good because you're the only one at the table drafting it. And so all of these blue-black cards, and this is kind of a stand-in, I guess, including the Signpost com Common, which is Sneaky Snacker, and the Signpost Uncommon, the 3-mana 2-3 lifelink that loots twice when it attacks, and Mindless Conscription here, all of these cards have ended up uh, being better and better because it's easier to draft a synergistic blue-black deck now, even though there aren't that many payoffs. Like, I still don't think it's a deck you should end up in all the time because sometimes... The payoffs aren't there. But if it's open and you're picking up the signpost common and uncommon and mindless conscription, you're kind of doing business. Like, you're going to be in pretty good shape. And, you know, conscription, um, I was a little disappointed in it at first. I think I gave it a B- in the set review because I loved that it was a 3-mana three 3-3 three, three up front. Uh, but just being able to make the zombie army bigger or getting a new one if it's died, um, triggering that is pretty easy in the blue-black decks. Easy enough. And if you only do it once you're kind of in business. Like, that's how efficient this is. If you can never trigger it, it doesn't feel great, but it's like an acceptable card. And then if you trigger it once and you've gotten, you know, six, six worth of zombie out of it for three mana, you really feel like you're pretty far ahead. And this card has been pretty important to those blue-black decks, which have really had a resurgence uh, of late because nobody else is drafting them. Let's look now at a card I got very wrong in the set review, and I've already discussed it some, but I think it's worth looking at its limited data right now, and that is Smelted Charge Bug. Um, I talked about this in the video where I talked about cards I was wrong about. Wasn't super impressed with this going into the set, um, but it has a, it's picked around pick 7.48, and it has a win rate of 56.6%. You know, it's not an insane card by any stretch, but it's a great two-drop, especially in the red-white deck. Um, in the black-red deck, too, which I don't think is a deck you're supposed to end up in that often, but kind of like blue-black, if that deck is crazy open, you can end up with a good one. Um, and so, you know, the charge bug is great on two. It enables you to attack on lots of boards that you wouldn't be able to otherwise. It allows you to push in damage late. You know, I've already talked about the card a significant amount here in this series, so I'm not going to go that much deeper on it. But suffice it to say, it continues to be a pretty good card, that you're happy to have in a couple of different red decks in the format, and it has really overperformed. Let's look now at Thraben Charm. I think this is another pretty interesting one to compare to Dog Umbra. 
Uh, because they're both removal spells, right? I mean, Dog Umbra also has this mode where it can save your creature from removal, which matters, but uh, it is interesting to look at Thraben Charm because it's taken a little bit later. It picks 7.71, and it has a win rate a full 1% higher than Dog Umbra. And for me, in this format, pretty much from the beginning, uh, picking the Charm over the Umbra has been the right thing to do. You know, it's just a pretty good removal spell. The white decks in this format, the really good ones, at least, the blue-white one and the red-white one, they have no problem doing four with this. And oftentimes, by the late game, it can just deal with anything. And then it has these other modes that don't come up that much, but they do come up. You know, there are enchantments to destroy, and every now and then your opponent, you know, you're playing against somebody who's doing some silly graveyard combo um, and being able to exile their graveyard in response to... Whatever it is they're trying to do feels really good. I mean, the main mode is the removal mode, but, and it does take some work, like you can't play this in a deck that doesn't have a decent number of creatures, but you just don't end up in a white deck that's like that in this format very often. So it just always is able to uh, be a, an efficient removal spell, almost always. And I think the fact that it's doing better than Dog Umbra, you know, you should be taking three of a charm ahead of Dog Umbra overall. Let's look now at Glimpse the Impossible. So this is taken around pick 7.97 and it has a win rate of 57.5%. This is a really sweet card. I like the design on it a lot, you know, going into the set. Paying three to kind of draw three. Um, you know, it's the red version of draw, so you don't necessarily get access to all the cards. They get exiled and you have a time limit to play them. But that card already, without this Eldrazi upside, in a lot of formats, would be pretty solid. I mean, it doesn't add to the board, but that can be some serious card advantage. Uh, so you've got that going for a card like, you know, Glimpse the Impossible. Probably be good in any format. But then you add in this Eldrazi spawn upside, where sometimes you can just cast this if you're trying to ramp into a big Eldrazi on your next turn and just get three spawns. Sometimes you cast one or two of the things it grabs you and then get a spawn or two spawns. Almost no matter what the outcome is on Glimpse the Impossible, though, you feel like you're getting your mana's worth. And obviously the best way to use it is usually to be able to use all the cards, but the fact that it has this mode where it's like you suddenly have three more mana. Like having that mode in a deck where you've got some big bomb Eldrazi or other creature, it doesn't even have to be an Eldrazi, you could be ramping into the Altasaur or whatever. Um, if you're doing that sort of thing, getting to it three turns earlier is just a huge bonus. So Glimpse the Impossible is just a really, really nice card. I will say part of the reason it has the, the stats that it does in terms of being taken as late as it is, is because it is hard to run more than one of them. So, you know, that does play a role in how highly a card like this is picked because you don't really want to take one ultra early because having more than one can be a little bit dangerous, you know. You can be slow and dirtily in this format and all that kind of thing, but you do kind of need to be doing something more significant than paying three to add minimally to the board or not add to the board at all. So that's part of the reason it, it is taken as late as it is, but I still think it's a card people are really underrating. Um, I mean, a 57.5% win rate is very good for a common. All right, let's look now at a Cursed Marauder. This is a card that's been better than I really expected in this format. Uh, it's taken around pick 7.59, and it has a win rate of 56.4%. So there just seems to be more board states where you can play this and hurt your opponent um, than I expected. I knew it said the non-token thing on it, right? Like, I knew it said that, but going into the format, like, that has mattered way more than I expected. Like, there have been so many times where my opponent or I have played an Accursed Marauder, and I've only got one non-token creature and I really don't want it to die. <laughs> like that happens even in the mid game uh, often enough. And then it has the same upside it usually has in the early game, you know, which is that it's, you know, can just kill your opponent's two drop or three drop or wherever you are on the curve. But it does end up killing real things all the time. Furthermore, there is enough recursion in the set that just getting it back and doing it again is, that's where the real value is. That's where this can get really strong because you always can sack the Marauder, right? Your opponent doesn't have that luxury. Like if they keep, if you keep getting it back, you're going to whittle down their board until they don't have anything that significant left. And there is, of course, you know, uh, the silly Chthonian Nightmare combo, which, you know, Chthonian Nightmare on its own hasn't been that good of a card in limited overall. It has been, I guess, better than I expected. I think I gave it a straight up F. And it's like, 
it's like a build around C type card, and it gets to that point with a Cursed Marauder where, you know, the, you can just keep getting back a Cursed Marauder with it and making your opponent sack stuff, and that's just silly. But, you know, the more ordinary recursion in the set that works a little more consistently also really works uh, with uh, a Cursed Marauder, and that's part of what's made it better than I expected. Next up, let's look at Solstice Zealot, which is being taken around pick 9 and has a win rate of 56.2%. So another card we can compare pretty directly to Dog Umbra because it's also white. We've seen a lot of Master Decoy type creatures, and by that what I mean is a creature that can tap other creatures. They've underperformed a ton in recent limited formats, but the main reason for that is that they ask you to pay mana to tap things. And that used to be okay, like in the days of actual Master Decoy and like Tempest Block Limited, Spending mana every turn to tap something of your opponent's was definitely worth doing, um, especially that little amount of mana. You know, paying one mana for it was especially a good deal. Even today, if we got enough of these that only cost one mana, they would be better. But we don't get them that often. We get them that cost two or three mana to tap things down. But you know what Solstice Zealot does? It doesn't cost any mana. <laughs> and so that's ended up being really nice. I especially like it in the blue-white deck because it can allow you to tap that stupid chrysalis that's keeping you from getting in for lethal. Um, you know, there's reach in this set. I wish they didn't give it to so many Eldrazi, but they did. And so you end up needing to tap a reach creature a lot in the blue-white deck. But the blue-red deck, or rather the red-white deck, really likes it too. It doesn't have as many flyers, generally speaking but it does have plenty of energy to go around to keep using the Zealot, and oftentimes getting your opponent's best blocker or their life linker out of the way or whatever can allow you to do lethal too. So it's a nice card that I want one of in most of my aggressive white decks in the format, especially the energy ones, obviously, and uh, it's performed pretty well, better than Dog Umbra, despite where it's being taken. Let's look now at Unfathomable Truths. So Casting this card has been one of the best feelings in this format for me. You know, my two favorite decks are probably blue-white and blue-green, and the blue-green deck hasn't been as good as the other Eldrazi deck has, the red-green one. It doesn't have the Chrysalis, but I really like playing that deck because it can ramp so effectively. You can find the time to cast, to pay five for Unfathomable Truths and draw three and make an Eldrazi spawn. And has a win rate of 57.5% and it's being taken around pick 7.6. It's a really similar card to um, Glimpse the Impossible in that neither of them are cards you necessarily want more than one of, but I think that first copy is really good. You know, it doesn't give you the same amount of... It doesn't have the same potential that Glimpse the Impossible does, but the fact it's an instant and the fact that you get all the cards in one spawn, it's sort of like, it's sort of like a more expensive Glimpse the Impossible in some ways, but it gives you more on average than Glimpse the Impossible does. And having one of these in most blue decks, or in blue-black decks, for that matter, that's another place where this has been really good, especially, you know, the later stages of this format, because it can single-handedly trigger your mindless conscriptions and stuff like that. So, it, you know, it's really good in blue-green and blue-black, and, uh, yeah, you don't really want more than one, just like Glimpse the Impossible, but that one is pretty good. All right, and our last card is Deem Inferior. So this is being taken around pick 8.3 and has a win rate of 57.8%. That's, that's the win rate of a card that's like right on the border of premium removal. And it seems like virtually every format people underrate this kind of card. And I feel like I end up talking about one in this video about underrated cards in every format, but people still seem to be doing it. Um, even though these cards keep panning out as rather effective. And what I mean by these cards is blue removal spells that put a permanent, or at least a creature, in this case it's non-land permanent, into the opponent's deck. Um, I think people look at this kind of card and they say, well, it's just bad removal because it doesn't permanently get rid of the creature. And like, okay, I guess if you wanna look at it that way, you can. But here's the thing, like if you're playing any kind of removal spell at all, there's a chance, a good chance, that your opponent draws a threat of equal or greater value on one of the next couple of turns, or plays a threat of equal or greater value. You don't know what's going to happen. 
Sure, with Demon Fury, you're basically guaranteeing, to some extent, that your opponent will be drawing that card in a couple turns. Uh, they can also choose to put it on the bottom if they don't want to draw it, and sometimes that is nice value too, especially in the early game where they're trying to hit a land drop and you bounce like their three drop and they just have to put it on the bottom. And that often feels even better, of course, but the point I'm trying to make here is that Demon Furrier trades one for one, just like any other solid removal spell can. And you have to remember that. You can't look at this as quote-unquote bad removal because it's just as good as any removal spell like if this was a sorcery for three mana which is usually what it costs right uh that destroys target creature it's not that different from demon inferior you know in some ways if your opponent has recursion it can even be worse to kill a creature right i mean that's more of a corner case but it's really not that much different than this being a three mana card that says destroy target creature so you have to think about this kind of removal as better than it is and like I said, it has this upside sometimes where your opponent is put in a pickle where they're like, I can put this back on top, but I really don't want to draw it, so I'm just going to get rid of it. Furthermore, casting Demon Furrier for like two mana is pretty common, especially in the blue-black deck. And casting it for one isn't unheard of either. And when you're casting this for two or one, I mean, it's basically becoming Doomblade or Swords to Plowshares. Obviously, I'm exaggerating, but the point is that it is still trading one for one, just like those cards do. And you shouldn't underrate these kinds of cards just because you're like, oh no, my opponent's drawing it again in a couple turns. Because that matters, yeah, to some extent, but it doesn't matter as much as people seem to be thinking based on where we keep seeing these cards end up in terms of their win rate and where they're being picked. So yeah, Demon Furrier is a lot better than it looks. All right, so that will do it for this particular edition of Neats and Notes. Like I said, next week we'll be jumping into early discussion about Bloomboro in that edition of Neats and Notes. That video is always fun to talk about new and returning mechanics and how I think they'll pan out. So make sure to tune in for that one. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future videos, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to catch up on past videos, including drafts of this format and stuff like that, then you should see some playlists on your screen shortly. Thanks for watching.